Um, Justin, just say a huge welcome to ODI. It's, it's absolutely great to have you here for, for many reasons. I, I think as, as much as anybody, you've put gender and gender equity right at the heart of DFID's strategy. And you've championed not just the, the great, in inverted commas, familiar causes, like getting more girls into school, but also the deeper and tougher issues associated with violence against women and girls, female genital mutilation, and child marriage. And I think at the heart of all of those issues, I mean, e each of them is separate and different, but what links them all is the unequal power relationships between men and women that are destroying opportunities on a global scale. And beyond your role in DFID, you've, you've just taken up um, membership of the high-level panel on women's economic empowerment with, um, uh, created by the Secretary General, but with um, Jim Yong Kim of the World Bank, other prominent economists and political leaders. And the, the issues that I think you'll be, discuss you'll be discussing on that panel are issues that have been at the heart of the discussions today. And, I'd, you know, it's been a very rich discussion, and I'm not going to try and you'll be relieved that I'm not going to try and summarise it um, now. But although many of the numbers are familiar, for me, they still really retain a power to shock that in the midst of what is an increasingly knowledge-based global economy, we have 16 million young girls who don't even have the chance to get the first foot on the ladder of educational opportunity. And that young women uh, and adolescent girls are twice as likely to be illiterate as their male counterparts. I, you know, I think that is a truly shocking figure. That over 40% of women aged between 20 and 24 were married before the age of 18. Uh, and 8% were married before the age of 15. Again, yeah, that is an extraordinary figure. And it's intimately linked, as, as we've heard from various speakers today, to the great challenges of maternal mortality, infant deaths, and the other causes that we've highlighted in the Sustainable Development Goals. And so if we're serious about the Sustainable Development Goal of eliminating child deaths, we have to get serious about eliminating child marriage, which is why it's great that you've taken it up. We know that women in South Asia are not only half as likely to participate in labor markets, but when they do participate, they're paid far less. They're operating in the most precarious parts of the economy. So, the, so these are some of the great injustices that we've been discussing today. There, there are four things that strike me as linking all of them. And the, 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 the first is that men, all of these challenges are actually interconnected, that if you think of child marriage and education, early marriage is, is an almost guaranteed passport out of the school system. But actually keeping kids, in, keeping young girls in school is actually one of the greatest defences against early marriage. And so if we, we, we can use the power of education to combat the evil of child marriage. You know, I, I find it hard to think of a tougher example of the links between gender inequity and inefficiency as a labor market story. You know, not educating half of your population because they're girls is the sort of economic policy equivalent of shooting yourself in the foot. And, and then excluding that same half of the population from a fair chance in labor markets is like taking out the other foot. So, you know, these, I, you know, I think are some of the issues that you'll be discussing on the high level panel. We know that inequality is a really big part of the problem. So child marriage rates are coming down, but they're not coming down for the poorest 20%. We know that 36 million births happen every year without skilled birth attendants. They happen overwhelmingly among poor women who are excluded from opportunities to utilize health system. Um, and I think we know from all of the discussions today that you know, this isn't, we, we need to look at this problem not just through the prism of economic policy or the law, but of all of the policy toolkit together, the law, the economics, the engagement with policymakers and building a movement. So I can't think of anybody better to round off the discussion today than, than you. So I'll, I'll pass over to you now. Thank Thanks, Justin.
Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Kevin. And I mean, it's just fantastic to be able to um, be here at the end of what I know has been a really amazing, very powerful day. And it's also fantastic because, of course, it's International Women's Day. And as we look ahead, I, I think what I see ahead of me for 2016 is that this is a really vital year in terms of pushing forward on women and girls' rights. And I know that some of you will be thinking, hang on, you actually said the same last year. And, and I did say last year that 2015 was also a key critical year um, for gender equality, and that was true too. And 2015 was an important year for girls and women because we successfully fought for the very first time for that standalone gender goal on goal five in the new Sustainable Development Goals. And I should say against, at times, some real opposition to having that goal in place. And in spite of that, now, for the first time ever in 2016, we've got key targets on sexual and reproductive health rights, ending FGM, and also on child marriage, amongst many other things. And I think what's more, we've actually ensured that gender equality runs through those global goals, um, because no goal can be considered achieved, whether it's on education, on sanitation, on health, unless it's achieved for everyone, women and men, uh, girls and boys, and no one can be left behind. So 2015 really mattered. But that's also why this year, 2016, is so important, because last year was about getting the rights of women and girls on the world's to-do list. But this year is about doing that to-do list and I don't think we should lose a single moment in making those goals now a reality. And as we've heard, 2016 will also be the year of the UN high-level panel on girls and women's economic empowerment announced by the UN Secretary General in January. It's really the first time that the UN have ever put together a high-level panel on this sort of issue. And Ban Ki-moon uh, rightly sees this as absolutely critical if we're going to see the Sustainable Development Goals actually work successfully. In fact, in his words, he said, to achieve the goals, we need a quantum leap in women's economic empowerment. So this panel is not just about making the next little baby steps. This is about a structural, fundamental change and step forward in women and girls' economic empowerment. And I absolutely share his view, and I'm very proud to be one of the founding members of that panel. I believe that women's economic empowerment is something that simply can't wait. Girls and women around the world can't wait. The world can't wait, and a lack of empowerment for women is pulling all of us down. And I want to be uh, very clear today that for me, when it comes to winning the battle on gender equality, we are getting there, but it's taking far too long. And yes, there have been big victories in the battle for women's rights. But frankly, for me, the pace of change has not been good enough. And that's also what I think we need to keep at the forefront of our minds in this International Women's Day. And the problems faced by girls and women will have been set out many, many times over the course of today. The statistics that in some parts of the world paint such a terrible picture for so many women. Child marriage. One in four girls in developing countries lightly married before the end of 18. Um, one in 12 before the age of 15. One in three women worldwide, as we know, beaten or go through sexual violence in their lifetime. How is that something any of us can accept? 200 million women around the world have undergone FGM. This represents brutal violence against girls and women on a daily basis. In Uganda, a woman is 123 times more likely to die in childbirth than a woman here in the UK. Globally, just 50% of women participate in formal labor, mar labor markets and have that sort of financial independence that that can bring, compared with 77% of men. In 17 countries, husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. In 29 countries, women are prohibited from working at night. In 34 countries, women do not have the same inheritance rights as men. And even here in Britain, 
we have to ask ourselves some searching questions. This year marks 150 years since John Stuart Mill uh, presented a petition to Parliament. The very first one that was asking to give women the same political rights as men had. But it took over six decades till 1928 when all women over 21 in Britain finally won the right to vote. Change really took time on voting rights here and we still have further to go. There are still many glass ceilings here in Britain to smash. I mean, let's look close to home for me as a politician. Party leaders have come and gone over the years, but there's still just been one out of all of them, one female leader of a major political party in Britain. And that was a long, long time ago. So long ago, actually, it was when I was growing up in the 1980s in Rotherham. And today there are more women on FTSE 350 boards than ever before, which is great news. And in fact, representation of women has more than doubled since 2011. But as the CBI Director General Carolyn Furman set out earlier this year, there are actually just nine more female executive directors on FTSE 350 boards than in 2010. And actually the number of female chief executives has actually hardly moved. Even in our schools, where you might think that there must be more equality, because women have been very well represented um, in the teaching profession for decades. Actually, only 37% of school heads are women, despite three quarters of teachers being female. So let's just, let's just look at the reverse of that. So 25% of teachers are blokes but actually they represent getting on for three quarters of the teachers who go on to become head teachers. Look at our own capital, we're sat here in London, one of the most advanced uh, capital countries, uh, cities in the world, more progress again needed. Less than a third of London assembly members are women, that's eight out of 25. On average, men working in the city earn over 20,000 pounds more than women. And more than half of all newly identified cases of FGM, around 1,300 in the UK from July to September last year, occurred right here in London. And when we look further afield, let's look globally. According to the World Economic Forum, the global gender gap across health, education, economic opportunity and politics has closed by only 4% in the last 10 years, with the economic gap closing in that time by just 3%. They suggest that at this rate, it will take another 118 years to close this gap completely. Well, is there anyone here who wants to wait till the year 2134? Because I don't. So let's, let's look at the alternative, though, because if girls and women were operating at their full potential and playing an identical role in labour markets to men's, then you look at the work that McKinsey's did in their Global Institute. Their recent research estimated that achieving gender parity would be worth around $28 trillion to the world's global economy, or 26% which is a huge, huge amount that could be added to global GDP in 2025. They estimate that here in the UK, gender parity could bring about 0.6 of a trillion pounds of additional annual GDP by 2025. That's a massive value from improving uh, gender equality and gender parity. So my point today is that the world shouldn't just wait for girls and women's economic empowerment to steadily happen, we should be looking to turbocharge it so that it speeds up at an unprecedented rate. And what all of this shows is that our global economy actually needs women's economic empowerment as much as any other lever that our central bankers can pull. So as well as being about basic human rights for girls and women, gender equality is also in all of our interests and when women are losing out, we're all losing out. And at a time when there's so much economic uncertainty in global markets, the world just can't afford to lock women out of the workplace. We need to be 
in the boardrooms, in the offices, in industry. And economic empowerment goes right to the heart of women's rights because it's about jobs, but it's also about access to bank accounts. It's about tackling violence against girls and women. It's about overcoming discriminatory laws and reducing the burden of unpaid domestic work. All of these things need to be on the to-do list for the high-level panel to look at and tackle. And I believe that women's economic empowerment is a game changer, both for tackling poverty, but also for building global prosperity. No country can afford to leave half its population behind. This has been going on for too long, and I don't accept it at all. The UN high-level panel is fundamentally going to be about turbocharging all of our efforts to deliver real and lasting change, and I'm very proud to be part of that. And the question for all of us today, therefore, is, is not just where we need to go, but how fast we can get there. How can we accelerate the pace of change? What's that going to take? And I think it comes down to voice, choice, and control again. We have to look at politics, as I've said. We have to look at the business world. We have to look at the attitudes that people have within their communities and countries, and even within the home. What about women having a real voice over the decisions that affect them and, and how we shape our world? Internationally, we really need the next UN Secretary General to really pick up the baton that's going to be handed over by the current one, Ban Ki-moon, on gender equality. So perhaps for the next UN Secretary General, it's time that they were a woman for the first time. Why not? And again, on women having a voice, we need women to be equally represented in parliaments around the world. In Somalia, where only 14% of MPs are women. In Sierra Leone, where just over 12% are women. But also in Japan, where only 9% are women. And in Britain, where it's still only 30%, despite the big progress that we have seen Made. So we need around 130 more women MPs here in Britain to be equal in Parliament. Let's find those 130 more women. And my message to women in Britain is, if you're a great, capable woman, then run. Run for Parliament. Run for local government. Run for being a police and crime commissioner. If you know a great, capable woman, then ask her to run. Dare I say hashtag, ask her to run. <laughs> so let's make this happen. We can do it. It's in our gift. What about women being able to choose their own futures, whether they're sitting in Britain's boardrooms or whether they are smallholder farmers in Ethiopia? They need to be empowered economically. And finally, the control that women have over their lives and their own bodies, our own bodies, when and how many children we have, when we get married, the right not to have FGM. We have to finally overcome these discriminatory social norms that are holding girls and women back, the cultures and tra the traditions that can define what a girl is for. And I believe that culture and tradition should never be used as an excuse for inaction on girls' and women's rights, and too often it is. So Britain is going to fight for a world where there is voice choice and control for girls and women. Nationally, we're continuing to get our own house in order. New league tables putting the spotlight on companies that aren't addressing the gender pay gap. Supporting more and more women to start and grow their own business, including through startup loans, mentoring, We've taken new steps that I think are really important on tackling FGM, on tackling forced marriage, setting up a forced marriage unit, as well as on uh, refuges and, and rape support centres. But internationally, for myself as Secretary of State for DFID, we're going to continue to work with countries that are moving in the same direction on this, supporting countries like Ethiopia, that are really now focused on stamping out harmful practices such as child marriage and FGM. And that political leadership is vital. But of course, it's not the case that you see this political leadership everywhere. So in the countries where that leadership just isn't there, 
we're going to keep on focusing, supporting those amazing grassroots movements, those local organisations, uh, the women's rights groups, the boys and men who are often the people advocating for change on the ground. Go back to John Stuart Mill. He was an amazing man fighting for women's rights. And it shows that men and boys can be the game changers on this just as much as girls and women. And indeed, when he presented that petition to allow women to vote in Parliament, the establishment was all against him in 1866. But by 1928, that resistance had really broken down when women finally got the vote. And it was because of a grassroots movement here that that changed. It was the suffragettes who kept fighting for change and in doing so transformed this amazing country that we all live in for the better. And I think it all adds up to this. The mission for gender equality will continue to underpin everything that we are doing at DFID. It underpins what this government is doing in the UK and it needs to underpin, I believe, the work of the UN, of all governments and businesses around our world. And, and I want to see this fight for women's rights having the same momentum, the same progress, the same international deal making and the same pace and urgency as we've seen around climate change in recent years. We got that groundbreaking deal in Paris on climate change. So if we can do a deal to save the planet, why can't we start doing the deals that are going to sort out gender equality once and for all in the 21st century? So I want to conclude with a call to action, not just to everyone in this room, but to everyone and anyone who cares about this issue, whatever your gender, wherever you are, whether you're in Britain or around the world, because inequality between men and women is the greatest unmet human challenge that the world continues to face this century. And it requires the same kind of global commitment that we're now seeing around climate change. And the whole world needs to rally around improving women's rights. The Sustainable Development Goals gave us a blueprint for women's rights around the world. So let's use it. And in the end, by building a better world for women, we're building a better world for everyone. And we can see the world that we all want. We just have to get there faster and we need to go further. And I've often said that when it comes to women's rights, if we're not winning this battle, then de facto we're losing it. And there's plenty of people out there who do think things have already gone too far. And they're going to try and claw back the progress that we've already made. They'll all be at the Commission on the Status of Women uh, next week in New York. But I am determined that over time we are steadily going to drown out their voices and those voices that are against women's rights and progress. And those people will steadily understand what it feels like to be in a minority, because that's what we need to make their voices. And that's because the other aspect of I think what we're now just starting to see is a network effect. Because as we're seeing more progress and more girls and women getting rights, there are actually more girls and women who've got rights who are now speaking up like the rest of us for those who haven't. So there are more and more and more voices that are there to call for change. So the more that we can be and give a voice to those that still don't have one, the more that we can all shout for change, the more that we can give that platform to those voices demanding change, <clears throat> I believe the more irresistible that movement will become until in the end, actually every country will have to move forward. I talked about John Stuart Mill at the beginning of this speech, and I don't want someone <laughs> to be here in my place in 150 years' time talking about this day, the speeches that I made, that other people made, because they're here also having to make a similar speech about the need for more pace, more urgency on women's rights, because there's still more to do. It's too long to wait. And in our lifetimes, for our girls, for our children, for everyone, let's all of us, men and women, girls and boys, 
finish off that job. Let's make women equal. Thank you. Justine, that, that was great. I think that sort of really captures the sense of urgency and ambition that you're, you're bringing to the issue, but, but also the fact that we need the political leadership and to create the movements that will drive it forward. Um, what I want to do is, because we're, um, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to take just one set of very brief questions from the floor. Um, and if you please say who you are and do keep the questions brief. Thank you. Hi, Jessica Woodruff from the Gender and Development Network. Um, it was so great to hear you talk about women's rights. Um, and it, it's so important to, to articulate um, the, the need for gender equality in that way. It was also really good to hear about you um, talking about e empowering women to make choices about their own future. Um, the other thing I want to commend you on is being part of the panel, um, the high-level panel on women's economic empowerment. I know that um, you actually had more involvement in that than, than you've, you've just let on. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you is how are you going to bring all of that together? Mm. How are you going to ensure that the quantum leap that you talked mm. about um, on women's economic empower, empowerment is rooted in women's rights mm. and is rooted in enabling women to choose for themselves their futures? I think it's, it's a really good question. And you're right, you know, the UK and I were really developing the ideas around what it was going to take to get a step change. And, and I think that what's interesting was that the ideas that we had in mind were also those that chimed with the UN and the Secretary General around the fact that we needed to do something different. We shouldn't expect things to suddenly dramatically take a leap forward unless we change them. So on the, um, so I think what we need to do is line up all the different bits of, as it were, international architecture commissional and status of women, we've got the global goals, we've got this high-level panel. What I expect and I hope might come out of the high-level panel is, is the same kind of movement and urgency as something along the lines of sustainable energy for all. What we need is to get a platform out of that panel that's about action and doing and delivery rather than just a report that has some good ideas that may or may not then be taken forward. So, so this is what I would like to see. I'm not one of the co-chairs of the panel, but I'm, I'm really determined to make sure that it essentially looks at the, 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 the gender goal and the sustainable de development goals overall, and then basically says, so right, how do we action this? Like we've got the to-do list, but how do we actually do it? What are the people, processes, monitoring systems? How does this translate from an international level to uh, domestic politics, what does it mean in terms of resourcing, how are we going to track it, what about transparency, what are the accountability mechanisms, I mean all of those questions need to get answered and, and I would say they need to be answered very quickly because as we saw with the MDGs it was easy to see several years pass before really people had started to confront those issues and, and that was important time that was missed in, in moving things forward and, and I'm, I think everybody's quite conscious of the need to to really get going on this high level panel and to really get going on these global goals which is why my message today was let's get on with this now because we spent too much time moving forward a bit it's now time to take a big step forward on this that's irreversible. Thank you. Okay. I'm Nikki van der Garg. I'm an independent consultant and co-author of the first State of the World's Fathers. We're mm -hmm. doing a lot of work on men and boys and gender mm -hmm. equality. Mm -hmm. I really welcome both, as Jessica says, your emphasis on women's rights, but also the fact that you said that men and boys can be game changers. And I'm wondering how you, bring, how you see bringing those two things together in the future. What's really struck me with the, the work that DFID has done is... is Two things. One is that some of the most powerful advocates are actually young people. And the more we can bring young people into this um, to speak for themselves about the kind of world that they want, which almost invariably is one where they see big steps forward on women's rights, women's rights, the better. But also the other really powerful voices were, were boys, young men, talking about what they wanted for their sis sisters and what they wanted in terms of their own children. So... They need to be, I think this is about building a coalition, essentially. You know, that's how you end up steadily winning this fight. Um, 
there will be those people who just don't want to see progress. Like I said, there, there are lots of people who think it's gone too far. So it's, it's about building a coalition steadily. And, and actually, just going back to your question, that, that's one of the other things, I think, for, for civil society, is how, how does everyone work more effectively together? You know, what's our common view of the, the women and girls agenda and the different elements of it in a way. So, you know, we talk about education, quite rightly, we talk about health, we talk about tackling FGM, and actually it's sort of systemic. But I think what perhaps none of us are really doing, and, and we're talking about this in DFID, is let's map out, frankly, all the work that is going on and, and where are the gaps? You know, there are gaps, where are the evidence gaps? It's really time to get quite serious and organized on this. Um, and start kind of stepping back to say how far have we got and why and, and where is it that we need to do more work. Um, everybody has a different role to play, um, but I, I think that there will be some areas where we're just, as it were, underperforming on, on what needs to be done. I felt, coming into this role, that one of the areas we were underperforming was, frankly, people in these kinds of roles I've, I'm lucky enough to have talking about this all the time so that it got through. And that's what I'm doing. Justine, thank you. Um, uh, one last question over here. Thank you. Um, Sally Baden from Social Development Direct. Um, like other people in the room, I'm hugely encouraged to see women's economic empowerment um, finally being put very high on the international um, agenda and, and um, appreciative of, of your own role and its role in that. Um, and... Um, just wanting to hear how, given the importance of women's economic rights around decent work to the empowerment agenda and the, the sort of broad coalition you're building around that with the unions, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. um, activists and the corporates, mm -hmm. how optimistic are you that, that the agenda of decent work for women and safe workplaces is going to really be advanced in this, in this high-level panel? Well, I think what's interesting is um, I think it, it can be a big part of what we achieve on the panel and, and in a way the way I look I've, I've started to sort of see the women and girls and, and the rights piece it, it's like a wheel with lots of different spokes and you know one spoke might be education another spoke might be child marriage and the bottom line is you, you grab it somewhere and give it a you know give it a shove round and it's a, just about pushing it from all these hands on the spokes all pushing it um, in the same direction and I think the case of um, workplace safety, good quality jobs, um, decent jobs. These, these, this is why we need the panel, because actually there are some real issues in all of those areas, but we're not going to fix them, if you like, by just talking about the issues. What we need to do is actually get people who have different roles to play in fixing them in the same room, starting to, to build a common agenda on, and how do we get over this then? And actually... What you start to learn, the more work that DFID does working with industry, is actually there is a common agenda in there, actually, because good quality businesses need sustainable business models. And they need employees that actually want to come in to work and, and, and that buy into what the companies are trying to do. And that needs to go hand in hand with strong regulation. But my sense is that as we see economies in many developing countries steadily grow, getting this right first time is absolutely vital. And we can learn from countries that have already gone down those paths. And, and you see countries like Bangladesh where actually we're having to sort of look more carefully and go back and say, well, how can we have responsible investment? But the key for me is running towards that problem and dealing with it. And that's why I'm pleased that business is part of this high-level panel, because we won't fix it by just talking at them. We fix these issues by talking with business. And dare I say, making it a race to the top and, and being clearer about who's getting it right and then using their standards to say to everyone else, well, why can't you do these things? These companies can, whether it's on workplace or indeed rights. Great. Justine, thank, thank you so much for, the, for that. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, it was great to start off with John Stuart Mill because you know I think the reason he was so ostracised because of that statement is that he was really attacking the norms and the attitudes that underpin your very deep injustices. 
but he was also doing it in a language that economists could relate to. And, and I think that combination of, um, you know, challenging economics and efficiency arguments and ethics and equity arguments is a really powerful mix, and you set it out beautifully. So thank, thank you so much for that. And it was a great way to end the day. So thank, thank you again. Um, so I think, Claire, I'm back, passing back to you now. <laughs>